What kind of wear and tear did that do to those four guys? Um, I don't know the answer to that, Terry. <laughs> Ask me. Okay, well, how do they cope with that? What do you think saved them? Because you look at Elvis and see how tragic Elvis ended up, and you look at these four guys who went through all they went through, and they turned out so good <laughs> and so normal. Well, you know, the whole thing about, uh, it's like any job, really. I mean, you just get on with it, with a day's work. You cope with what comes up. But it never, it, it didn't strike me or all the Beatles as being important at the time. I mean, now when you look back in retrospect, over the years you realize uh, how important it was. But I wish I'd have kept diaries and things like that, you know. But it wasn't important. You had a discussion about something, you listened to the music, you made your comments about it. It either went out or it didn't go out. And uh, we, you know, sat around and tried to work out because I, what I went there for, went to Apple for, was really to try and exercise uh, them into doing more films, you know, after Hard Day's Night. And um, finding a subject was the most incredibly difficult thing for them. Uh, because, as I've said before, they had to agree. You know, the four of them had to agree on everything, otherwise you had no deal. Uh, that was a contract, that's the way it worked. But, um, yeah, it, it became, Fairly normal, surprisingly enough. I mean, they weren't mad, you know? They were just four bright guys that had this incredible talent, you know? And they turned out to be the phenomena of the, the, of the, the century, really, with their music, which, which transcends all groups, you know, classical as well as, as uh, pop groups. So, looking back on it, you know, from Yellow Submarine on, right through to the end. In fact, I was doing a thing today on the, on the uh, broadcast, on the, on the phone, and uh, <laughs> the, the fellow asked me the question, he said, did Alan Klein fire you? I said, Alan Klein was never in a position to fire me. I was the film producer there. And what happened was, he didn't fire me, I left. I left with Paul, uh, and Paul Corden said, listen, now you're coming out. So I went down and signed over my directorship because I didn't want to stay at Apple at that time uh, with, with uh, what was going on. And um, Paul said, read this contract. So I read it, it was on one page. I said, it's infamous, absolutely infamous. So Paul said, well, I'm not going to sign it, Dennis. I'm not going to do this, you know. And so he said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going back to my day job and producing films. <laughs> and that was that, really. What was it like to get up and go to the office in the morning when it was Apple? Was it total chaos? Oh, they were good. I mean, the memories of those days were good because, you know, they were very, very famous people at that time. And uh, they were good. But, you know, in, in spite of that, evenings and things like that, when one went on the town a little bit, Nobody troubled us that much, you know, in England at that, much, that time. Um, it was only when they went on tours and things. Uh, I, I was party to going on, their, they did a show in Madrid. Um, I, I did write about it in the book, but I'll tell you the story if you don't mind. And um, I was doing a film out there, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. And uh, all the kids said, you know, Beatles are performing in the, in the Plaza Doras here in the ball ring, uh, but we can't get tickets. Could, could I help? So I called where they were. I, I got their hotel from uh, London, from NEMS, and called, and, Paul, and John answered the phone. Dennis, where are you? So I'm here in Madrid. Come over and have a cup of tea. So I went over and had a cup of tea, told him the story, gave me the tickets, and, everything. and time went on, we were talking away, and he said, uh, come to the show with us. And I said, well, you know, I'm supposed to be producing a picture down the road, you know. But, but yeah, I'd love to. So we're in the room. The next thing you know, one of their helpers comes up, all panic, out the back door, down the back stairs, and to a car. The chauffeur turned around and said, who's he? Because I was sitting in the back with the Beatles. I said, he's with us. <laughs> you know, don't worry about that. All through Madrid, uh, kids and people climbing all over the car into the ball ring, but nothing happened for two hours. We were, sta we were sitting in the infirmaria where they take the bullfighters after they've been nearly killed, uh, sometimes, and um, 
here we were in this awful surround, and I thought, my God, it's ridiculous. And, and I, at that point, I thought, now I know what it takes, you know, for these guys to, to, to go through this. And it, was, and it was an extraordinary experience. Okay, they go on the stage, you couldn't hear anything of the music, you know, for the screaming and the shouting and the whole thing. Major success, Terry. And uh, it was an extraordinary experience in my life, really. We are open to questions. If somebody would like to ask Dennis a question, please come on up here and we'll give you the microphone. But you weren't a stranger to that pandemonium because you worked with them on a hard day's night and it must have been difficult to keep the girls at bay as they were trying to do the film. Yeah, it, um, it was dangerous, you know. It was very dangerous. It was a dangerous time. Because this building that we were filming in, particularly on hard days, that, that was the most dangerous part. When we were in the streets and out on location, you could control it to a certain extent until it became overwhelming with the number. But when we were in the Scala Theatre, that was dangerous because there was some building work going on and they had big ladders and things up to the top. These kids were climbing up these ladders, I mean, six stories. And there was one funny story about that, and coming in the roof, you know, and, and, and the, the danger was incredible. There was one funny story. <coughs> I was, uh, my assistant came to me and said, there's a man outside trying to get in, and he said he's John Lennon's father. So I said, what did he say his name was? Because his name was Freddie, and I knew that. Uh, and he said, uh, I didn't ask him. So I said, I went down, and true enough, it was John Lennon's father. So I go back to John, and I said, uh, your dad's here. You know, what should we do? He said, tell him to off. <laughs> So I said, listen, John, nobody tells their father to mm, off. <laughs> so he said, oh, well, all right, maybe you're right. So we brought him in. He hadn't seen his father for years, and he turned up at the stage door of the thing, and he came in, I think he put a bite on John for a few pounds or something, and, and disappeared. But I mean, it was an extraordinary thing to see the crowd. Uh, there was one nice story about Paul on, on that occasion. Because we, we got in all the youngsters we could to fill the theatre on, on three layers of, of, of balconies, you know. And one day Paul was missing. Just disappeared, I don't know where he was. And I eventually found him way up in the gods with this whole bunch of young kids around him, you know. And he was really signing autographs and talking to them and telling them that they mustn't make a noise when they're, you know, while we were filming and all this stuff. And it was really charming. It was absolutely charming. Uh, again, one thing with Paul, we, everywhere we went in, in England, outside all the offices, well, let me start by telling you what happened to me just outside. One minute ago, a woman comes to me and she said, you remember me? Of course I don't. I mean, we're talking about 1964. So, uh, and we both look a little older. She said, I slept in your room at the St. Regis. I said, what? <laughs> So I said, well, how did that happen? She said, well, you were with Derek Taylor, that lovely man that used to work at Apple. And uh, we wanted to see the Beatles. We wanted to meet the Beatles. And you were so nice. You said, yeah, well, we can arrange that for you. They were 18, 17, 18 years old. American kids outside St. Regis. So they finished up in, in, in the room in the hotel. And she said, I remember you saying, right, you've got over your first hurt in life. You're going to meet the Beatles. Now, you're going to get over your second. <laughs> but, but it wasn't so. They just fled. <laughs> but it was interesting to, to, for her memory. She knew every word. Of, well, I don't remember that, you know, because they were just kids, and they were kids all the time that one, you know, tried to uh, keep out of your rooms and stuff like that. They just came in. I mean, they just came, used to come in the hotels. You come back from doing whatever you had to do in the day, you know, the Johnny Carson show and things like that. They'd be in your room. We, we were aware of the danger of that, you know, so the hotel usually took care of it. But it was extraordinary to talk to somebody like that. And it took my mind back to everywhere we went, they knew where the Beatles were going to be. This, this little hardcore group of fans They'd run away from America and come to England. God knows what their families thought. They used to wear those old army things in those days, you remember? And they came back, and everywhere we went, there was this group outside. And you got to know them, you know, got to know them by name. And you know, of course, you couldn't, you know, invite them into the studio and what. Uh, and uh, 
I was having dinner with Paul one day in a restaurant. We were sitting just by the window, and it was pouring with rain. I mean, it was torrenting down. And there were these kids outside, absolutely soaking wet. I said, Paul, you know, we've got to do something. I, I really feel bad about all these kids. He said, ask them in. <laughs> <laughs> so they all came in, and we all had dinner together. <laughs> Well, it must have been the biggest thing in their lives, you know, at that time. But um, Paul, Paul had that sort of gentle side and, and respect for, you know, the fans that uh, was, was really quite charming, you know. But uh, the memories of Hard Day's Night were really wonderful because, you know, it wasn't like making a film. It was like going through a process of filming the Beatles doing what they do best, you know. In, in a natural way. Uh, nowadays, you know, everything is over rehearsed and scripted and done. With the Beatles, you could leave it, you could leave them to their own devices, you know, and they invented what they, they wanted to say virtually. And most of that's in the picture, and I think that adds to the success of the picture, no question about it. But it, has, having said that, there was a difficult side to them. For example, with the Yellow Submarine, which is now, as we know, it's a classic classic movie. <clears throat> that goes back before my time, but um, Brian Epstein had done a deal with uh, Al Brodax of King Features to do uh, an animation cartoon thing of the Beatles. Bear in mind they weren't as famous then, you know, as they were. Uh, and the, the provision in the contract was if it was successful, it would allow them to do a feature cartoon uh, animation film. Now that came up three or four years later and, and they started it. That's when I was into Apple. So I, I was very interested to find that one of the writers of it was a really good writer. He was a professor of languages and, and a really good writer, a man called Siegel. And he eventually wrote that wonderful film called Love Story. I don't know whether you remember that. And um, so I got interested in, in, in The Yellow Submarine. And I went to see the quality of the work, you know, because it was the early days of animation then. And it was brilliant. I thought it was brilliant. Yes. You know, and I said to the Beatles, hey, I've done a deal with Albert X that we put this out as an Apple film, providing you fellas, you know, come to and do your own voices. Wouldn't do it. No way would they do that. And I said, but I've seen the work, it's fantastic. And it did go out as an Apple film, but it really wasn't an Apple film. And then I persuaded them to do that end bit on, on it, you know. They even threw the music in, you know. It, it, it just happened to be brilliant again, but they, you know, they, they really didn't give, give any credibility to the, to the thing. And it was a shame, really, because I think as much as they, you know, they did use voice imitators, it would have been so much better, because the Beatles would have put their own style in, their own words, and... But, you know, it's history, it's a success, and it's wonderful. Well, maybe you could set the record straight, because we read things sometimes and find out later that wasn't the way it was, but what we've read is the Beatles weren't interested at all in that project until they saw it, the finished product, and then they, they liked it, then they thought, this is brilliant, and yeah. did that little thing at the end. But is that true? They, they really were skeptical, but then were won over? Well, um... You know, with their records, Terry, with their, if you just take the, the music, there was never any hidden message in them, really. Uh, they, um, they wrote it, and it went down, and it was either liked or disregarded. Everything was likely, but it was either disregarded. Somebody asked me this morning, what was the, uh, what was the, uh, what was the significance of Rubber Soul? I mean, 64, would you believe? There was no significance, it was a record of its time, that's all. It was an LP of its time. And the significance was put on by, by the people that bought it, you know, and, and the fans of the Beatles. There were exceptions to the rule, like with Hey Jude, which was written for, you know, when, when John broke up from Cynthia, wasn't it? Yeah. And um, so, it, it, you know, it, just, it, it was just a, a job, it was a day job, you know, <laughs> really and truly. But, it, I mean, when you think of the phenomena of it, it's been quite extraordinary, hasn't it? Who would have thought at the time that you'd be here now in 2003 in the United States talking about all this? 
Well, I was just talking to Andy, you know, uh, he wrote this incredible book with, which took him six years to, you know, to, to research all that. And I said, what you didn't put in your book is what happened. And that was, I was walking through India with, it, with George and we walked into a sitar shop where he was, he was buying his sitar. But it wasn't important. I mean, now it's important to know what sort he bought and what, how he did it. But um, that's the way life was in those days, you know. Very free. <laughs> well, you worked with them through many years and you saw a lot of changes in them as you know, the life progressed. Because their lives, we all change from year to year, but they seem to pack so much more into one year, so they went through some dramatic changes. If you could go one at a time and, and your observations of each individual guy and what they were like and your relationship with them, work relationship and how they change. You know, maybe starting with John. Uh, yeah, you know, when you're with somebody day, day in and day out for six years, you don't particularly notice a change, but if you look back, um, they were significant. Um, it's a shame in a way, they learned too much. <laughs> you know, when they started, they were poor, innocent kids that were amazed at their own success. Uh, bright, intelligent, witty, uh, and, and above all, enjoying life like mad, you know. But then, as time goes on, life, you know, does intrude on them a little bit. Um, and it became, from, in that six years, I recognized the freedom of coming to America and being swamped at the airport and, and thousands of fans, no problem, no problem at all, wonderful, to the end, when they actually were afraid of appearing in public together. And that, that was the sadness of that, Terry. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I did the Hey Jude promo, because I wanted them to play together, and promos had gotten to such a ridiculous entity at that point, you know, uh, after really a group called Queen um, actually started that, and they were really very good. And then they got to ridiculous length. That's one of the reasons why I went right back and I thought, wouldn't it be great to see them play together again, you know, and, and, and recapture some of the joy of it, you know, which actually happened on the clip. And in fact, they were so surprised that it worked. I mean, they all said, hey, when we finished it, some four o'clock in the morning or something, they all said, hey, this was great, you know, we really enjoyed that. Now we'll do a show, you know, now we'll do Let It Be or Get Back, whatever you want to call it. And, um, but, but you're right, the change was from freedom to fear, really. It was really that. And you could understand it, because after the Manila fiasco, you remember when, when that happened, um, that would put the fear. And, and by the way, everywhere you went at that point, I mean, kids were out with scissors cutting hair and pulling bits of clothes off, and you, you, couldn't, you couldn't cope with it, you know? You got so big, you couldn't cope with that. That's why I wanted them to go back to, to do films and, and do more music. That's why I wanted, you know, uh, I, I would love them to have done, you know, a film that I had the idea of doing Lord of the Rings. Because I, somebody asked me why I, why I thought about that. And I stopped to think, and I thought, I know why I did it. I saw them as four little people in Middle Earth. I mean, the world saw them as great, great, successful things, but I saw them as four little people in Middle Earth, accompanied by Donovan, you know, who was, who was part of that scene at the time. And I had this idea of putting them all into this, which would have turned out to be a wonderful movie. But when I had that idea, it was over 30 years ago. It was about 34 years ago. So it would have been, wouldn't it have been fascinating to see the Beatles in Lord of the Rings? <laughs> wouldn't that have been something? It was great. Yeah, I am disappointed, and I think we all are, that they didn't make more films because we'd have that now to, to well, see over and over. But I think Help maybe disillusioned them a bit because they felt like there was somebody else's movie. It wasn't like A Hard Day's Night. Well, uh, yeah, Terry, I mean, it was one of the reasons why I went to Apple, why I agreed to go there, you know, when jo jo uh, uh, Paul and John asked me if I'd go and after Brian died, sadly. And... Um, it was, I, the principal reason, I have to be honest, was, was because I, I wanted them to do some films, you know. I wanted to see more of them and, and some. But <laughs> there was one story about that. It, it became quite clear to me 
um, after talking some ridiculous subjects, you know, I mean, remaking the Elvis pictures and all that stuff, it so happened that the guy that made the first two Elvis pictures was a very good friend of my man called Hal Canto, good writer, and he directed them, he's a lovely man, he, he does all the uh, Academy Awards stuff, the Bob Hope and all that stuff. And I would have loved to work with him, but it wouldn't have worked for the Beatles, obviously. So I, after lots of toing and throwing and, and thinking about it, I thought, yeah, well, there is one way. If we could film a film that was shot in three weeks, then maybe we could get a feature film back on the screen. Who? So I thought of uh, the French director, uh, Jean-Luc Godard, who had a, a wonderful history of filmmaking you know, in France. And I called him and he came over because he was intrigued with the idea. And he said, what, what do you think the subject would be? I said, day in the life, whatever you want to do, you know, you can do the freedom as long as we don't take more than three weeks. So eventually it went that far and, and uh, Paul engineered, he knew the strength of the guy, Jean-Luc Godard, and he persuaded the others and they all agreed to do it. And I thought, great, got it financed, got it contracted you know, which you have to do with films and, and to guarantee distribution and all that stuff. Paul came by one Sunday, I got a phone call. Uh, Dennis, can I come and see you one Sunday? He came by, I said, yeah, come for tea. So we went, came by, he ate practically all of my favorite cream cake. <laughs> and, <laughs> and my son um, had just been sort of born about that period, baby, baby. And I thought, now, what is he, he hasn't come for a Sunday out, he's come for a problem, you know. So in comes Paul, he has his tea, chat, 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 talk to my wife Donna, uh, picks up the baby, which is Aaron, who's now an airline pilot, and his wife's sitting right there, <laughs> picks up the baby, and uh, he said, uh, you were a caesarean baby. He's talking to a baby that can't talk back, you know. And uh, he said, but I tell you something, I thought this guy is really good. He said, caesareans are much more intelligent than normal born babies. He said, I know because I was one. <laughs> so so now I said, hey Paul, you didn't come here to discuss the wonders of motherhood. That's for sure. I said, what, what, what is it? He said, well, this film. I said, yes. George doesn't want to do it. That's the film finished. It was contracted, and we, I said, hey, Paul, I have to tell you, they could sue us for, for whatever. He said, well, George doesn't want to do it. I said, well, I pulled out, I had the contract, and I said, here's the contract to make the film. Now, this house that we lived in at that time was almost by the River Thames in England. He said, give it to me, I'll drop it in the Thames on the way out. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> he did. I called, you know, explained to the and said, look, you, you got first option on the next one if it ever comes up. No, it never came up. But I mean, that was the difficulty of, of, uh, of working. They didn't think it was important. They just wanted to do what they wanted to do. So, well, if you could come out of retirement tomorrow and take over Apple again, what would you do? How would you change it? Now? Yeah, if you were well, well, king yeah, of Apple. That's a very good question, because I've often thought about that. It's a, an excellent question. I've come to the conclusion, the conclusion of it. It's, it's now, now it operates in exactly the way we left it. The, all the, all the, um, the legal background was all cleared up, all the merchandising problems they had, which is history, you know, they had them with Paul Bradley who tried to manage, manage them all. The records and music are now being used. The anthology was written. The, 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 the television anthology, which I started there as a film library, being in films all my life, I knew the, the extent and the value of a library, you know. So I started that. That eventually went out on television as the anthology, which we all know. Um, it's exactly as the way we left it, exactly. And, but there was a period when it all changed with, uh, with when Alan Klein came in with Yoko and John and they went off on their own. But right now, with, uh, before George died, unfortunately, um, the three of them were doing exactly the way we left it. They pitied, even to the extent of them, which they, I think they've taken too far, of endorsing product. 
you know, I said the whole thing about the Beatles is there's so much freedom with it, it should be controlled by your own company, which is why I set up all those companies around the world. But, um, but uh, that was all thrown out of the window for about a year when, uh, when Alan was there and Clive was there. And then when he left, because I think he was incarcerated for something in the States. <laughs> he went for a long holiday anyway, <laughs> as a guest of the government, of the American government. And um, he, uh, when he left, and then it went right back to where it was when we left it. So now, the only alteration I think I would make, I wanted to, uh, them to be a publishing company as well, uh, for, for literature and books and poetry and, and all the things that they love to do, you know. Um, and even art, but that, that's the only thing I would have added to it right now, if I had gone back. But, hey, they made a lot of money last year, you know, as a, a, it's a very successful company now. I mean, Apple is a very successful private company, and they're all very wealthy gentlemen. <laughs> What's amazing when they released one, that album of all the number one hits, how that continues to sell like crazy. You know, the, the album with all the Beatle hits, and all these young kids are going out and buying it too, and yeah. hearing it for the first time, and it's just, it's like it never stops. Who would have thought, you know, 40 years later is still going. Well, the, the, the logo, you mean? No, I mean the, the album where they put all the hits, number one, all the uh, number one uh, hits. Well, that thing, that's one of the biggest selling albums of all time. Yes, it's that's amazing. True. Well, it was a funny thing about it. The first, uh, uh, the first thing that happened there when, with uh, record distribution and writing was our first four. You know, they put four uh, 45s on in, in a package and we packaged it. Um, and uh, that, I remember, I remember saying, we would better give this the, the ultimate uh, bit of publicity. So we sent 10 copies round to the Queen. <laughs> What she made of it, I don't know. She didn't say. <laughs> but uh, it was extraordinary. I remember you think that uh, there was one song on it I remember called Sour Milk Sea. I don't know what the Queen would make of that, Sour Milk <laughs> Sea, but you know, we never got a rig percussion. But yeah, it was, um, it was a number one. It was beautiful, you know, to do that. The company got off to a really great start. But, uh, but you know, it was at the time, too, when the Beatles, after Brian died, they felt they wanted their freedom to do individual things. John particularly, John particularly. In fact, I still wonder how I ever got him to play in, in my film, How I Won the War. But uh, here's one, one lovely story. Donna. For the first time, John was on his own. He wasn't with the Beatles, and we were on location in Spain. And he said to me, uh, Ennis, he said, you know, I'm a bit worried about this. He said, I, I, I'm out of my depth here with all these well-known English actors that were playing the part. And he said, I'm very out of my depth here. I said, hey, John, that's what directors are for. Go and talk to Richard Lester about it, and I'm sure he'll help you through it and take care of you. Don't worry about it. So that was the end of the conversation. About two years later, oh, oh, that's what he said. He said, yeah, he said, I'm out of control. He said, I'm totally out of my depth and out of control here. And about two years later, we were talking about something or other, general, generalities. And he said, uh, you remember that? that uh, I said, yeah. I said, did you ever go and talk to uh, Lester about Dick Lester? He said, yeah. I said, what happened? He said, I realized I was in control and he was out of control. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure that's not true, but I mean, that was a Johnism, you know, it was terrible <laughs> like that. I mean, I had a difference of opinion with him once on, on, a, on a film. He wanted me to, uh, to get on the circuits in England, an exhibit that he and Yoko had done. And I went to see it uh, at Paul's house. He was staying in Paul's house in St. John's Wood, north, of north London. It was poor in his brain, I remember, and it took me hell to get over there to get taxes and stuff like that. Got in the thing, and I had a big party I wanted to go to that night. So I was hustling a bit to get this done. He projected on the door, upside down, this film they made. And I said, well, what is it about? He said, it's about my nose. He said, if you look carefully, it moves. I said, well, noses do move, you know. 
And we fell out because it, I said, I'm just not going to even think about putting it on the circuit, you know, for people. Yeah, it was on a, maybe it's an art house movie, I don't know, but it's certainly not my uh, thing. It wouldn't talk to me for three months. And um, eventually I went back into my office one day and there was a great big white card on the desk with a dot. And he said, I was here. <laughs> John Lennon and a drawing of himself on the thing, which was charming, really, you know. He was, I liked John. He was, I was very close to him. He was a, in fact, when I met Yoko after he, that awful thing that happened to him, I met Yoko in a restaurant in New York. Uh, I said I didn't call or anything like that because I didn't want to, you know, be part of the bereavement process, but I was really sorry to hear about it. She said, you know, Dennis, we used to talk about you a lot. He said, Don't I? and I thought that was great, you know, because we moved to the States and we never saw each other again. But, he, I, yeah, I, John was terrific, really. You're terrific. When's the last time you saw John? Do you remember? What I? The last time you saw John? Do you remember that encounter? Last time I saw John. Let me think about that. Do you know, I cannot remember. Because, you see, I mean, we used to meet sort of almost every day, you see, until he, because he went to, the, oh, I know the last time I saw him. Yeah, the last time I saw John was when we were coming out to uh, New York on the, um, on the, on the, uh, the Queen Elizabeth, on its second maiden voyage. It was one after the maiden voyage. And John was coming with us. I mean, Ringo came with us. And Peter Sellers was there too. Terry Southern, the, the American writer, lovely man. And um, John wanted to come with us. And we tried, like damn, to get a, a visa for him, but they wouldn't issue a visa. Uh, and he came to actually the, the Southampton, where the boat left from, still in the hope that he could get on the boat and come with us. But they, they wouldn't allow him in the States. So I said, listen, you come on the boat, but you have to stay on the boat and come back. And he, so he decided not. That was the last time I saw John. Um, it's it, yeah, amazing. It was amazing. Cause it, it was sad because, you know, I think he'd been in some problem with drugs, uh, you know, in those days. With, uh, so he couldn't get a visa to go to the States. Eventually, of course, he came out here to live, which was live and die, I'm afraid to say. But, um, yeah, it was great. It was great. It's funny, it's a good question you asked, Chuck, because now it's starting to be saying, when's the last time I saw any of them? <laughs> you know, it really is true. You know, the last time I saw Paul, well, Paul and Linda together, it's not the last time I saw Paul, but Paul and Linda. Um, I was at the studio, and uh, I, somebody had said, oh, Paul McCartney's in the studio. Um, and uh, he was over in one of the recording rooms, and he was at a business meeting over a film that he'd made, uh, and they didn't want to put it on, they tried to sell it. It was a, a thing of the, the Wings concerts, you know, that, that. And um, so I, I thought, well, I'll go over and say hello, you know. And I went over to the, the thing, and he wasn't there, but Linda was there. And she was standing outside. And I said, hey, I'd love to see you, you know, a, a big hello and all that thing. Immediately produced one of her books. She said, are you a veggie yet? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I eat a big steak every day, Linda. <laughs> so she gave me the book. So I said, listen, don't interrupt, Paul. Just tell him. Yeah, I said, hello. I said, are you kidding? He'd kill me. If you, if I said, you know, you were here. So in she goes and he comes out. And he said two things. He came out, out of this meeting and threw his arms up. And he says, Jean-Luc Godard. <laughs> and then I said, hey, wait a minute. And he said, Drake's drum, we've still got the horse, Dennis. <laughs> I thought it was great. And that was the last time I saw him, him and Linda together, which is sad too. Linda yeah. was lovely, wasn't she? Oh, yeah. She's she was wonderful. One, one I, 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 I missed her enormously, and I liked her enormously. And she was she, a talent, you know. She was a real talent. talent. And good for Paul. I mean, I really oh, think perfect. she did. Perfect for yeah, Paul. she did wonderful perfect. things for Paul. There's a picture in my book of, of Paul and uh, Jane Asher that I took in India, and I, we came across this sort of strange place that they had in India where and there was a sign up saying, marriage is arranged here. So I got him and Jane Asher to stand each side of it and took a picture of it, <laughs> but it never happened. She's been quite successful too, Jane yes, Asher. Yes, yes, she's, she's a very fine actress. Right, yeah. yeah, she became a very fine actress. But that, that's a good thing about the Beatles. They did 
encourage quite talented people around them all the time. They, they also managed to get a lot of lunatics, you know, but they, they did get quite, <laughs> quite good people around them at some time. And they were always into it, you know, they were into a bit of art and a bit of writing and a bit of this and a bit of that. So it was, it was great. It was a wonderful time, you know, it was a wonderful time, really. Wonderful. And, and, and you know, when they, I mean, I'd been producing and, and I've been in the most incredible position in my life. I'm not a young man, as you can see, but I spent my entire life in film, waking up in the morning and wanting to go to work. I bet not many of you here want to do that on a Monday morning, but it was a wonderful, wonderful time, you know. And uh, so, and to have the Beatles as well was a major, major plus, major plus in my life. Six years of it, you know. Amazing. Amazing, really. Six very important years. You know. yeah, very important years, Terry. If yeah. anyone has a question for Dennis, they can come up here. But I wonder, you haven't talked much about George. What was uh, your relationship like with George? Uh, who's George? Uh, well, your relationship with George? How your feelings about George? With well, George, um, you know, George was a, a lovely human being. He was a, a very, he was a, a very pious man, a very proper man, George. He was a lovely, lovely human being. Um, I mean, when we went to India, for example, the first thing he said to me was, Dennis, Dennis, come and, come and look. He took me into a room and he said, I can levitate. He was a very religious man, George, you know, and, and a genuinely religious man, and a very quiet man, uh, and underestimated, I think, by the Beatles, because some of the stuff that he wrote Still my first favorite song, Beatles song, was written by George. It was something, you know, it was wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. And uh, it, George was, uh, where's the others somehow, when it happened, you think, you know, George was a real sadness when he went, you know, I, I, he just left a big hole there, you know. But um, he's a lovely man. Bit mean, <laughs> didn't part with much, but, but still nice. Yeah, I just want to say that. We were at uh, 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 some convention thing for, uh, I think it was New Zealand, Australian thing, uh, the, uh, the uh, Australian Embassy in London, and Brian had arranged this people's thing, and I went with them. And when we got there, you know, crowds of people, and they gave them a, a, a big thing of the produce of Australia, which were mainly apples, <laughs> I think, and, and, and whatever. And uh, nobody ever picked it up or took it away, it was all just left there. The only person that the next day asked me where it was, was George. <laughs> I said, I think you wanted the apples. Excuse me. Hi, Dennis. I just want to say I really enjoyed your talk the last couple of days. I, I wonder if you know, could... I'm going to come closer or something. Oh, okay. It's echoing around here. Okay. Um, I wonder if you talk a little bit more about the concept and scope that the Beatles had in establishing the Apple's Films divisions. And I asked the question in, in light of two things. Were they, were they focused more on doing and continuing to do the, the innovative um, promotional films and in additional features of themselves? Or were they more interested in, in becoming producers and producing other people's things through the division, which would be particularly interesting since George eventually became a film producer himself. It's an interesting question because um, when I went there um, with this idea of films in mind, um, it never, it, it never, it wasn't in my, on my agenda that we were just going to make Beatle films. Uh, I had gone with uh, at least four other subjects. One of them was um, a, a classic Australian film that was made called Walkabout that uh, Nicholas Rove, a good friend of mine, did. That was the first project there. No, I, I explained to them that we, I didn't want to do just Beatles films. I wanted them to involve maybe with the music, like George did the music to Wonderwall, which I arranged for him to do. You know, the film is long since forgotten, but the music exists and it's beautiful. But. Um, it's a good question. No, I tried to, to interest them in, in doing outside films. The problem was, there was no money there, believe it or not. The money was tied up in shares and God knows what. I think in the film division, I was absolutely shocked to see when I went there, that I think there was no more than about 50 or 60,000 pounds, which was like, it wouldn't buy, it wouldn't buy a, a page of a script, you know. 
And, um, but I, I maintain that they were still bankable. You know, you could borrow money uh, uh, for film with the distributors against it. Uh, yeah, I, no, I, I had two or three subjects I went in there with. One was, uh, which was made, another one was called The Jam, which was like a Holocaust type picture. Uh, and one or two others, which they agreed to do. But uh, they never gave any uh, assistance in that direction. You know, uh, it would have developed if it had happened. It would have developed, you know, I would have got, like we did Magic Christian, I got Paul to do the music. And, you know, it, it, I could have integrated it, you know. But we never actually got it off the ground, you know, before. Yeah. Hey, it was only about a year or so that uh, after that, that uh, the clan came in and, and stopped the whole thing. Uh, it was a shame, really, because... Uh, yeah, that's a, uh, it, an addendum to your question, Terry, was that, yeah, I would have developed the film division more. Were you involved at all with Magical Mystery Tour? <laughs> yes. Well, in the anthology, um, which I'm sure a lot of you have read, and I haven't, but it was pointed out to me, but what the book I'm talking about, Paul actually says that he doesn't know whose idea it was, which was interesting because I don't know, but I do know that he and I had exactly the same idea. My idea went a little further than his. Now, what it was was this. They wanted to do something. They wanted to go out and do something. And they, without preparation, without, you know, any film pre-production, as we call it, you know, investigate, finding locations, costumes, signing contracts. George, Paul came to my office and he drew a circle and he split it up into four sections. And he said, I want to do, you know, four of them do thing. So I said, at the same time, I said, well, look at this. I do a circle and put five sections in. So I said, now what my idea was, was that we, each of the Beatles, who wanted to be inventive and, and take care of their own lives, wrote and directed a 20 minute section of the circle, and I would do a 20 minute segue into to join them all up somehow, you know, when I saw what, whatever was going to be done. I said, Now, the only thing about this, I'm not going to do this if you don't write. You must write a 20 minute sequence. Well, uh, he said, what, 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 would, what would you use to join it up? And I said, I would use a magician, because with a magician, you can do anything. Anyway, Three days after, they were off and running, no script, no 20-minute segment, goodbye, <laughs> not knowing where they were going. They left with the, the, the bus on the, you know, the first trip. That got stuck under a bridge, and, <laughs> and, and it was chaos. I mean chaos. As it happened, I, I, I brought in a young, uh, a young film editor who had been involved in music, so he, he knew roughly. It took months to get, you know, sense into it, to get it into any form like that. And then it got even worse because I had been talking to NBC or ABC at that time, putting it out here. Now, the way we would do it in films, I explained to them, put the music out first, which the tracks were wonderful, wonderful track. Put the music out first, sell, 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 and then put the film out where everybody knew what they were going to see. Now, Paul didn't want to do that. He said, the BBC have been really nice to us in our lives. Going to the BBC, the day after Christmas, in black and white. <laughs> oh, I thought, my God, well, you could, the rest is history. You must have read the reviews. But, the, but eventually we, we managed to, you know, I had this idea of, of I, I said, hey, the, the thing, if it's going to work, it's for the young. It's a new approach to the cinema or whatever. So I suggested we put it round, we offer it to every university in America uh, for a day, for a fee, you know, and they can run it 10,000 times if they want in, in the day. It made a lot of money <laughs> doing that. But that's the Beatles for it. The music was wonderful, you know? There, there are parts of it that are brilliant. I mean, I think the I Am The Walrus uh, sequence, Yeah, wasn't that something? That was worth it just for that alone, you know. I thought that yeah, was it was wonderful, work. wasn't it? I yeah. love that. That was John, so, you know, that was entirely his idea. And, and, and yeah, that was, that was brilliant, I thought. The interesting thing was, there was one sequence, I think it was called Flying, I can't recall it. Forgive me if I can't. 
And, and we had nothing for it, no background for the song, you know, for the music. And I suggested to Paul that maybe we, what we could do was to use some beautiful sky um, stuff, you know. And I'd remembered that um, uh, Kubrick, in his film um, Doctor Strangelove, had spent days and days filming skies and clouds and stuff for some sequence in the film. So I, managed, I got hold of some of this stuff and we tinted it, you know, coloured it to match some music. It didn't go out on BBC with it, but we coloured it. And uh, about three days after the Christmas uh, programme and they put it out, I got a call from Kubrick. How dare I use his... I couldn't believe this man actually recognised his own cloud. I, never, I couldn't believe it. But... Uh, but <laughs> so, so that was that. But, uh, I tell you, life with the Beatles wasn't always easy. <laughs> <laughs> but it was entertaining. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah so that was magical mystery to it. And, um, and then, what did we do? We do we, uh, what we do? Huh? <laughs> but somebody wrote that, uh, somebody gave me the credit for it, which I'm delighted to take, and said that uh, it was a new way of filming and it was avant garde and it was. I, so I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing what George did with handmade films. He did, you know, helping Monty yes. Python out, saving a, that, uh, one of their films, and then doing some other production. George seemed to really love film and being in the behind the scenes part you know, of it. You know, Terry, that's quite extraordinary. It's quite extraordinary. Because George was the one that didn't like films right. Right. when we were there. He was always the one that, he, like I just told you, he wouldn't do uh, the Jean Luc Godard right. picture. He wouldn't do the, uh, the idea I had at the end of uh, Let It Be or Get Back for shooting it, you know, abroad in Zabratha. George was the one that never did. And then he suddenly left. He never spoke, he never spoke to, talked to me about handmade films at all. And, and I was the only one there with any film experience, real film experience. And he went a hot He got bitten though, didn't he? I mean, I think, I think he... he uh, I think he liked being behind the camera. I think yeah. maybe it was that he, yeah. he didn't like the focus on him. Yeah. I got the blame for all that, because the guy that did it was a man called Dennis O'Brien. So everybody thought, I don't know, my name's Dennis O'Dell, and they, and they thought it was all me. So I got the blame for all that. That's one of the reasons why I prompted to put it in the book, because I seriously got the blame for it. And, and I gather about six million pounds went missing, you know. So I didn't want that over my head. That was very disillusioning for yeah. him, I think. But yeah. it, it was extraordinary because George was the one that was least interested in films and he was the only one that had a film company. Right, right. And we're, story, we're, isn't it? we're about out of time, but uh, before we uh, go here, I want you to talk about Ringo a bit because I think Ringo really emerged as a natural talent on film. And who would have thought the guy sitting behind the drum kit was usually you know, the, the least focused on in Hard Day's Night just about stole the film and then went on to make a lot of other films on his own. Yes. Um, well, with Ring, he was so laid back, you know, Ringo in those days, that you felt you could do almost anything with him. You know, you, you, you never took him seriously of being anything except the, the drummer. Uh, uh, and a lot of people said not even a great drummer, but, but he was, of course. But you could do almost anything with him. Now, now when we did uh, Magic Christian, when I produced Magic Christian, um, Peter Sellers wanted John to play and I said that um, I just didn't see John in that sort of a part, you know, because it was a tongue-in-cheek, uh, uh, quite humorous part. And uh, so we had a little difference about that, but then John said he wouldn't do it anyway, so that was fine. But I was having lunch with Ringo uh, in the local pub, just around from the Apple offices. And I suddenly thought, God, you know, be... I said, hey, Ring, you buy lunch and you're a film star tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, great, so he did it. Was it a good lunch? Yeah, he yeah, paid for lunch. Very yeah. good. Yeah, about the only time, I want to tell you. <laughs> 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 but, uh, yeah, it, it, they, were, but that's what, they were so easy going in those days, you know, and that was, was the fascination of it. They put, the, they put themselves in your hands, which was nice, Terry, you know? Right. If, if they trust if they trusted if they you they yeah you trust were one of the people, people they trusted mm. yeah. yeah and with the exception of maybe Alan Klein they had really good instincts you know I mean they 
having Brian around, I think Brian was such a big Absolutely. part. Absolutely. Alistair Taylor and, and Derek Taylor, all those yeah. people. They really attracted people that were so loyal to them. Yes. What was it that inspired that kind of loyalty? Because you obviously felt it too. What was it about them that, was, that made that chemistry? Well, the, there was a group around them, you know, they'd been with them for a long time. Uh, it's funny enough, when they were at the, the zenith of their careers, you couldn't get to the Beatles. I mean, Brian protected them like crazy. But uh, Peter Brown, who was uh, uh, Brian, uh, uh, Brian Epstein's assistant, told me, he said, um, there is a list of people that can talk to the Beatles direct. And 10 names are on it. I never asked him who the other 10 was, but my name was on it. Uh, you know, which was, I was very flattered about because, uh, you know, I, we, I just, we, at that point we weren't in business or anything like that, we were just friends. And, um, they were very loyal, even when Klein came in and fired half the, half the group. Oh, there's one funny thing about that. Loyal to a, up to a point. John brought in one day, uh, and they had quite, we had quite a few people working in and out the organization at that time. John brought in one day a mystic whose name was Caleb. Uh, it could have been Fred or Lionel living out in the suburbs as far as I was concerned, because I don't believe he was a mystic. But he used to come in and sit on the floor in my office and throw the I Ching. You know those things where he decides people's lives. The next day, two guys get fired if it came up wrong. <laughs> that was John. And he believed it. He be like he believed in Magic Alex. You know, he believed it. But this guy, he did it with me one day, you know. I said, fortunately, I came out on top. <laughs> but I mean, can you imagine firing guys on Throwing up an eye chin. So, I mean, lot you only went so far, Terry. It got a little goofy at the end there, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Magic Alex and all those crazy yeah. folks in there. But yeah. it's really been a pleasure having you at the fest because you are on that list of 10 and, and you're a wonderful man with some great stories and we, we, we hope you come back sometime because well, it's, it's, been it's really been a joy. I just want to say it's been an absolute pleasure being here. I mean, really a pleasure. I think it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And, and where can they meet up with you later? Are you signing books? Are you going to be in the forum room later? I think I have to go in now and sign a few books. And, uh, okay. It's a good read, though. Do you know what? It's extraordinary. There is one person. That told you, I did a broadcast by, by telephone this morning. And this man... I mean, it was wonderful. I, I don't know if anybody knows him. What is he called? Uh, Dr. Bob uh, Pseudonym. And um, he said, oh, yeah, I read your book. And he said, I love every word. He said, I've read it three times. This is a, a radio. I thought, wow, wonderful. I don't know why it won't sell. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's wonderful. Well, I, next I just, time you listen to you know my name, look up the number, think, I know that guy, Dennis O'Dell. <laughs> Freeman, a bonus. I brought my minder along. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> the bouncer. Yeah, I just wanted to introduce my good friend, Dennis because we had great times on the filming of Holiday's Night, where he made the film work. And uh, I took a few photographs, that's all. But I mean, he, he's the one who did all the work, and he's a great friend. Dennis, over to you. Thank you, thank you. Terry, uh, if you'll excuse me one moment, one thing I want to say about these photographs. I was looking at them, you know, recently, after all these years, and I was amazed to find that when you look into what he did for the Beatles at that period, look into their eyes and look into their faces and see what life has done to them now. <laughs> Where's the look? <laughs> All right. Same goes for Dennis. Sorry about that, Terry. He follows me everywhere. <laughs> We'll call security. Yeah, we'll take care of him. <laughs>
<laughs> He's always trying to take your picture, isn't he? <laughs> Uh, well, what about the uh, wear and tear on the Beatles? You know, we, we've chatted about uh, offstage, actually, so let's share with them about, like, what Manila, what the experience of Manila did about the loss of privacy and, and all the pandemonium.